thank you everyone for joining uh, today. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and as sane as can be expected. Uh, I know I'm trying to juggle uh, taking care of my one and a half year old while working. Uh, so <laughs> everyone's kind of got their own situation. Uh, so I really appreciate everybody taking the time to discuss what is a really critical issue in the midst of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, and that is the issue of housing stability and security. So we are really fortunate to be joined today by Diane Yantel, who is the president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Uh, my name is Yulia Panfil. I am the director of the Future of Property Rights Program at New America. Our program looks at land, housing, and property rights issues, both domestically and internationally. And uh, you know, as everyone during this time, we're trying to understand how we can best help uh, in uh, the crisis. And uh, we're really lucky to be uh, hosting Diane to uh, tell everyone a little bit more about the current housing implications of COVID-19 and uh, what is being done to address them. Uh, so Diane, welcome. Uh, first, let's start, if you could just in a few words tell our audience uh, what does the National Low Income uh, Housing Coalition do? Sure, yeah, and thanks for having me. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. So at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, our work is about advancing federal policy solutions to ensure that the lowest income people have decent, safe, accessible, and affordable homes. And that was a tremendous challenge before coronavirus, and it's only worsening because of it. Sure. And if you could set the stage a bit, could you just describe in macro terms the current housing makeup or situation for most Americans? So broad numbers in terms of percentage of renters versus homeowners, the general percentage of income spent on uh, rent or mortgage payments, uh, approximately what uh, average or median rent or mortgage payment looks like in the US, any sort of broad picture that you could paint for us? Well, I'll paint the picture from our perspective, which is the lowest income renters. So uh, we focus on people who are at 30% or below area median income or below the poverty line. They're known as extremely low income. So these are families, for example, you might have uh, two working families with two kids and together they're combined are two working parents with two kids and uh, their combined family income is less than $25,000 a year. Or it may be a, a single person with a disability who is relying on disability benefits and they are bringing in about $12,000 a year. So we're talking about people who are deeply poor um, and our uh, research shows that for them, there is a shortage of 7 million homes that are affordable and available to them across the country. So another way of saying that same number is for every 100 of the lowest income renters, there are just 36 homes that are affordable and available to them. So as a result of this uh, severe shortage, we have about 8 million families who are extremely low income and they're paying at least half of their income towards rent each month. Many are paying much more. They're paying 60, 70, even 80% of their income towards rent just to keep a roof over their heads each month. Uh, and you can imagine that if you have such limited income to begin with and you're paying so much of it for your home, um, you're just one financial emergency, one unexpected expense away from not being able to pay the rent. Uh, and for many of these lowest income renters, of course, coronavirus uh, and the financial fallout from it may be that financial emergency. And just to add too that there are also uh, in our country about 550,000 people who don't have homes at all. They are uh, experiencing homelessness, they're sleeping in shelters, they're sleeping in homeless encampments. Um, and for them too, obviously the challenges that coronavirus presents are severe and urgent and unique. 
Absolutely. And let's jump into that and the kind of the impacts that coronavirus will have on these lower income renters, homeowners, and homeless populations. Before we jump in, just a uh, quick note, uh, we will be taking audience Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can just drop them into the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen and uh, we'll be taking those questions. I'll read out the questions for Diane uh, at about the half hour mark. Um, so turning to COVID-19, uh, as we are seeing, you know, just this morning, we saw numbers of skyrocketing unemployment claims, something like 3.3 million. Uh, as jobs are being lost and hours are being cut due to uh, COVID, uh, how are you seeing this impacting housing stability for the populations that you work with? Sure, and there's a lot to say there. Um, I, I'd start with the people whose needs are most dire and most urgent, and that's people who are experiencing homelessness. So, as I said, you know, there's oh, there's over half a million people who are sleeping in congregate shelters, or they're sleeping in homeless encampments and tents. Um, some are sleeping in their cars or in RVs, and for any of those. Um, situations, the people who are experiencing homelessness are at very high risk, both of getting very sick from the illness if they were to be um, exposed to it, because many people who are experiencing homelessness um, are also experiencing some of the underlying health conditions that put them at real risk of severe illness and even death from the disease. They're also at risk of spreading the disease uh, because of the nature of how one lives when they're homeless. Um, and if you're in an encampment or if you're in a shelter, you know, you're sleeping shoulder to shoulder among other high risk people. So there's tremendous needs there. We are in close touch with a number of homeless shelter providers and outreach workers across the country. And they are facing like really overwhelming demands and challenges. Many of them, you know, they're frontline workers, just like doctors and nurses are, but they don't have the equipment that other frontline workers, that some other frontline workers do, right? They don't have masks, they don't have hand sanitizer, they don't have gloves, um, they don't have the things that they need to keep themselves and others safe. So as a result, many of, many of these shelter providers themselves are getting sick and they're not able to show up at work. Volunteers aren't able to show up at work. They're having a hard time keeping their doors open. We know of close to 20 shelters that have closed over the last week because they don't have the resources they need. They're certainly not able to take in more people in need. Um, and they're also not able to, they don't have the resources or the ability to separate people for social distancing at the least or for isolation and quarantining when needed. So there's a tremendous set of needs there and we could talk about sort of how we meet those needs. But then also, as I said, when we have, you know, 8 million deeply poor families who before the coronavirus came to the country were struggling to keep roofs over their heads. And now from the financial fallout, as you said, you know, they're losing hours, they're losing jobs, or they're getting sick and losing hours as a result of that. Now they can't pay the rent and the rent is due on April 1st. So there are, um, we have to ensure, especially in the midst of a public health emergency, right, when our collective health depends on our ability to stay home, we have to ensure, one, that we're housing people who are currently homeless, and also that we are preventing any additional people from becoming homeless. And if we're not very careful um, and not providing the policies and the resources needed, we'll see a huge spike in homelessness in the coming months. Absolutely. And, you know, there's the kind of famous statistic that something like 60% of Americans say they couldn't afford an unexpected $500 right. expense. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this, you know, uh, rent and mortgage yeah. is usually more than that. So uh, this would absolutely, as you said earlier, Diane, this would be the sort of economic shock that we could anticipate will put people over the edge and sort of out of their housing. Um, could, could you touch uh, for a moment on a uh, particularly vulnerable group, uh, which is seniors? Uh, mm -hmm. So as we know, seniors are uh, particularly vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. There's also a large uh, demographic of seniors living in poverty or without a stable income. Uh, can you talk about the uh, particular implications on uh, seniors? 
Sure. I mean, as you say, seniors, we, we all know very well from the news that seniors are at very high risk from this illness, and we have to be doing all that we can to protect them from any kind of exposure to the illness, because um, if they get it, chances are they're going to get very, very sick and possibly die. The vast majority of people um, who are extremely low income, who are already struggling to pay the rent, they're either seniors, they're people with disabilities, or they're people who are um, have all of the underlying health conditions that come with living in poverty, right? They have asthma, they have uh, obesity, they have diabetes, they have other chronic health conditions. So really the entire population of extremely low income renters um, are very vulnerable to this illness and certainly seniors most of all. In, um, in the homeless shelters, there are a number of seniors. There are a number of uh, seniors who are actually sleeping in tents on sidewalks as well um, and in homeless encampments. And right now, um, there's very little ability to keep them safe, to do all the things that we know are needed to keep them safe. And again, that comes back to the shelter providers and the outreach workers just not having the resources. For example, in a homeless shelter, if there are seniors in that shelter, they, they ought to be in separate rooms from everybody else um, just to be extra careful that they don't um, be exposed to the illness. But shelters don't, for the most part, they don't have the ability to do that, or they should be put in hotel rooms, again, to be kept safer. There are also a number of, um, of subsidized housing developments across the country. It, again, in many of them, in all of them, there is a significant segment of seniors living within them. But there are also some developments that are targeted directly for seniors only. So you have um, full apartment buildings that are subsidized by the federal government that are housing very poor and um, elderly tenants. There too, so they have their own apartments for now that they're able to stay in, but those housing providers, for the most part, um, and especially the ones who are subsidized by the federal government, they don't have the resources they need to be doing all the deep cleaning that needs to happen in those buildings, again, to keep people safe. So you're right that, that seniors are really a, a very, very vulnerable to this disease. There are things that we can be doing to keep them safer, but until now, the resources have not been available to do that. So very little, unfortunately, has been done. Thanks, Diane. And I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, the need for not just housing, but for safe and adequate housing. So it's not enough to provide housing, particularly for seniors who are um, so susceptible to uh, this illness. You know, we have to make sure that it's adequate to meet their needs. Yeah. Well, and actually, if I could just yeah, say please. something for that, too. That's that's absolutely right. The, the housing itself has to be healthy. Um, in order for people who are in that housing to remain healthy or get healthy. And that's another challenge that we have with our country's public housing stock. So we have about 2 million uh, families that are living in public housing um, across the country. And the pub, again, before coronavirus even came, we have a tremendous challenge with repairing public housing and keeping it in good shape because we've had decades of disinvestment uh, in the programs that are needed to actually repair those units. And so many public housing developments are in very poor shape and there's mold uh, and there's many other issues that make those homes unhealthy uh, and unsafe for the people who are living in them. Then you add coronavirus and the potential for contagion and people who maybe are exposed to coron coronavirus living in those units um, and you can see just the, the um, challenges that we face. And you can see too, just how short-sighted, right? All of our disinvestment, all of our lack of attention to the issues of homelessness and housing poverty and housing health and safety have led us to. These challenges that we face now are so tremendous. And if only we had recognized months or years ago how central housing is to our individual and our collective health, 
we'd be in a very different position. And so at least I hope that as a country, we learn that lesson from these challenges and we, we do things differently in the future. Absolutely. So um, switching to kind of, you know, we've painted a broad picture of why this is such a crisis. Uh, Dan, what is the federal government currently doing to try to address the fallout, the housing fallout of COVID-19? Um, if you could touch on maybe some of the contents in the stimulus bill, uh, as well as any other uh, you know, solutions that are being put forward by the federal government. Yeah, so there's some relief there, thank goodness. And after like many, many long hours and incredible effort from people across the country to educate and pressure members of Congress to do something, they are starting to do something. So uh, I think, um, first let me just briefly say what, what the policy solutions are, and then I can say what has, is being done so far. So from our view, of course, we're focusing initially on the most immediate and the most dire needs. And again, those are, are among people who are experiencing homelessness and um, uh, cost burdened, extremely low income renters. So what's needed there is there is a program called Emergency Solutions Grants. These are flexible dollars that homeless shelter providers and outreach workers can use to meet all of the needs that I've talked about. Um, and in the first two stimulus packages or spending packages, there was nothing for ESG or no resources whatsoever for homeless shelter providers or outreach workers. There's also a need, uh, as I said, to keep extremely low income renters housed, make sure that we're not adding to the homeless population. And for that, what's most immediately needed is a moratorium on evictions and on foreclosures. Nobody should be at risk of or even worried about losing their home in the midst of a pandemic. And together with that, there has to be really substantial rental assistance provided so that low-income renters aren't saddled with more debt at the end of this crisis and so that small landlords can continue to maintain and operate properties. So until this week, uh, Congress had done nothing on any of these issues. Um, but now in the current spending package that's about to pass the House tomorrow and probably be signed by the President tomorrow too, there are some really significant resources um, that will provide some immediate relief to communities. So there is $4 billion of funding for emergency shelter grants. Again, this and most uh, half of that money is required to get out to communities within 30 days. So that's gonna provide some really significant relief. Um, for the outreach workers and the shelter providers and for people experiencing homelessness. There is a somewhat limited moratorium on foreclosures and on evictions. And we can talk if it's helpful about what the distinctions are there. Um, there's no specific rental assistance provided, but there's some big pots of money that can be used for that purpose. Um, so it's a, it's a very good, important first step. This bill is is just what's needed right now. There will be much more needed um, in the long term and Congress will pass certainly at least one, if not two more packages. And at that point, they'll be focused on stimulating the economy. And that is when we will have an opportunity, I think, to get some resources for uh, affordable housing construction and repair, which serves the dual purpose of stimulating the economy and getting people safely and affordably housed. So there is some relief happening now. It's a huge relief, I know, to us at the coalition uh, who have been hearing nonstop from the tremendous needs at the local level, and especially a, a relief for our partners at the, at, at the local level. But now we have to work with HUD to make sure that they get those dollars out quickly and effectively and to the resources, uh, to the communities that need it most. And there's going to be some challenges there too, frankly, with this administration to get those dollars out as quickly as they're needed. But we'll keep working on that. Great. Um, Diane, uh, coming back to uh, one of the uh, kind of measures that you had mentioned, which is a partial or a limited moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. Mm -hmm. So um, could you uh, speak about that in a bit more detail? Uh, uh, you know, my understanding is that this is specifically for FHA insured properties. So can you sort of break down the distinction for us? Who is covered? Who isn't covered? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's broader than that now, and uh, it's 
you know, one of the challenges is that there's a piecemeal approach going on rather than a blanket uniform policy. So um, it's challenging right now to see where the gaps are and where the holes are and then to think about how to fill them. You know, we have pushed for and what's most needed is really just a uniform blanket moratorium on evictions and foreclosures for everybody for the length of the pandemic. That's not what we have right now. One thing that we have um, at the state and local level is some real momentum to create or put into effect these type of moratoriums. So last I checked, and it changes by the hour, last I checked there were over a dozen states who had um, implemented some type of moratorium on evictions or foreclosures, sometimes both. And there were about two dozen cities and counties that have done the same. So for people who live in those communities, they, they have the assurances that they need. Of course, it doesn't help the people who don't. And it's not always clear who exactly those moratoriums uh, cover. At the federal level, um, there are now moratoriums through a few different actions from the administration and now what will be in, in this, this supplemental bill that will be passed. Um, well, at the, on the foreclosure side, there are moratoriums for borrowers who have mortgages that are backed by FHA, as you said, but also Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the VA, and the USDA. That's a very broad swath of mortgages throughout the country. There are some estimates that it would cover 80 to 90 percent of home owners with mortgages. Um, I can't verify those, those estimates. We're still, we're still running the numbers, but that's what some have estimated. Now there's also, for many of these, um, these borrowers, if they also request forbearance, in other words, some relief from pay, paying their mortgage payments, they have to uh, commit to not evicting tenants that are in their properties, whether it's multifamily properties or single family properties. So again, it requires an action by the borrower first for the tenant to have that security, um, but there could be a, a pretty wide swath of renters that are covered under this. There's also in the legislation that will be signed soon, a broad moratorium on evictions for any tenants in subsidized housing, whether that housing is subsidized by HUD, by USDA, or by the Treasury through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. So again, it's a little piecemeal. It's hard still to look at the full picture and see where the whole the gaps are. There are certainly still gaps, but I'd say we're getting closer um, to pretty broad protections for renters and uh, homeowners. The challenge is that even as we have these um, these moratoriums on evictions or forbearance for, um, for mortgage holders is that, especially in the case of the evictions, we have to make sure that many of these small, sometimes mom and pop landlords can continue to maintain their properties. And they can't do that if the rental income is not coming in, especially if that goes on for a long period of time. That's why rental assistance is so important to be paired with these moratoriums. And we still don't have the resources we need to ensure that. We definitely wanna make sure that at the end of this, whenever, whenever it is, when we come out of this crisis, that we haven't lost some of the precious little affordable housing stock that we have. So we have to protect the renters and we have to make sure that we're not losing the stock itself. Right, and that's a really interesting uh, consideration. I think it's easy to vilify the landlords uh, for uh, evicting tenants, but at the same time, you know, we have to make sure that, as you say, the landlords can also be paying their mortgage. So these two things go hand in hand. And I think that the, the policy that you described earlier of sort of making a commitment not to evict a condition of mortgage forbearance is a really clever one. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty, yeah. that's unprecedented too, I would say that, uh, you know, in previous disasters, um, nat mostly hurricanes, other natural disasters, um, there's often 
uh, moratoriums on foreclosures on federally backed mortgages. That's not unique. That's something I expected they would do this time um, and, and was glad when they did. Taking the next step to, on that forbearance piece and requiring a commitment not to evict tenants. Uh, FHFA went first on that just a few days ago and required that of um, uh, mortgage mortgages backed by Fannie and Freddie, and that's an unprecedented step. I don't think we've ever seen that after a disaster. Now the Congress is following suit. Um, I think it's really a, a, a recognition of, of the magnitude of this disaster and the, the new creativity and willingness to go further than we've gone before to respond to it. So what uh, else should the federal, and, and then after this, we'll move to um, local very quickly and then uh, finish up, but uh, you know, what else should the federal government be doing um, that they haven't done yet? So if you were to choose two or three of the most urgent priorities that lawmakers have not yet adequately addressed and should, what would they be? Uh, um, it's a great question. Well, on the one hand, um, those there is there's certainly good news uh, around the funding that Congress is about to provide for emergency solutions grants of four billion dollars. We're really pleased with that, but we know that uh, the needs are much greater than that. That we worked with um, some very well known and well respected researchers, Dennis Colhane from the University of Pennsylvania, and some of his colleagues. They did an analysis of how much money shelter providers and outreach workers will need to actually meet all of, uh, to keep people safe and keep people alive. And it's closer to 15 and a half billion dollars. So there are some ways that we can get those additional resources from disaster funds, from FEMA, from state and local and other places, but Congress will need to provide more in order to, to really meet all of these needs. The rental assistance piece again is a very big one that so far is not being met. We're gonna need tens of billions of dollars from the federal government to meet those rental assistance needs for all the reasons that we talked about. Um, and then there's also a number of challenges that subsidized housing providers will face um, in that you have people who own and operate subsidized housing. Again, similar to the outreach workers and the shelter providers, their staff are getting sick, they're having to telework, they're trying to figure out how to keep people housed um, with the limited staff time that they have. And so there are some waivers that are gonna be required. There's gonna be a lot of creative thinking that we need to do together with Congress, with HUD, with our partners there to make sure that these um, owners are also able to continue to operate their programs so that the very low income people that live within them stay housed through the crisis as well. Okay. Great. Um, Diane, you had mentioned earlier that uh, there are, uh, you know, at least a uh, dozen uh, local or states that have uh, passed moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures, and there are other local efforts that are, uh, you know, pretty forward thinking and creative in uh, dealing with the housing fallout of this crisis. Are there any local efforts that you would like to highlight as particularly effective or innovative? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of amazing creativity and innovation going on, uh, despite or maybe because of, of the challenges and the pressure they create. Uh, there, there are, it's hard to name just one because we have so many incredible partners at the local level, um, some in Connecticut, some in California, some in Seattle. Uh, in New York and some of the real hotspots where uh, coronavirus is spreading fastest and creating the biggest risk for these very vulnerable people, where they are in different cases pooling together um, private resources, foundation resources, sometimes state and local resources to fill the gap that the federal government has left and do what they need to do. So for example, in um, California, there's this amazing group called Destination Home that's run by Jen Loving in Santa Clara. They've been incredibly creative and have worked together with Cisco that provided them with, uh, I think it was $10 million to quickly create a rental assistance program to get people who are in homeless encampments or in shelters into apartments. And they've been working really fast to do that. It's incredibly effective. I think within 15 hours of the announcement, they had received almost 2,000 applications. So it shows 
both the creativity and the public-private partnerships that are happening and the overwhelming demand that can't possibly be met by the uh, private sector or the uh, philanthropic sector. Um, also in, in um, Connecticut, in California, in Washington, they're taking, um, <clears throat> they're recognizing that many of the hotels are increasingly vacant for all the obvious reasons and are creating some partnerships and some contracts with these hotels in order to move people from shelters or encampments into hotel rooms for all the reasons that we talked about. So that's been helpful and creative as well. And on the eviction and moratorium side too, um, there's been some really strong leadership um, in many cities in, in California, at the state of Indiana, the state of New Jersey, there's really a, a long list um, that have stepped forward early to recognize the need to provide assurance to people that they won't lose their homes during this crisis. Um, and so in different ways have, have created these moratoriums. It's interesting too, sometimes the moratoriums are coming from the state level, the governor is, is mandating these moratoriums. In other cases, city councils are passing similar kind of um, policies. In some cases, it's the sheriff's associations who are saying we're not going to enforce evictions because we recognize that people should stay housed. Um, all of this really much needed leadership that hopefully will trickle up to the federal government to show similar leadership with a uniform policy. Diane, I want to ask about the actual delivery and implementation of these really innovative solutions. So as we know, in this country, only approximately one in four households who is eligible for housing assistance actually gets it for a multitude right. of reasons, right? So there's a delivery problem, there's an access problem, there's an awareness problem, even in sort of, sort of air quotes, normal times. Yeah. So how do we make sure that the aid that's being offered through both the federal and the state and local um, packages and at, that, at those levels is actually getting to people yeah. and that they know how to take advantage of it? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I uh, to, I'd say that the um, the challenges that we face, as as you said, in better times <clears throat> before coronavirus, we have a system in our country where it's a housing lottery system, and only one in every four households, as you said, gets any assistance. And seventy five percent of the people who need assistance and are eligible for it get none. That's not a delivery problem. That's a resources problem. Um, the, the, cha the only reason why that is the case is because the federal government is not funding the solutions at the scale necessary um, to end homelessness and end housing poverty. We have a pretty efficient delivery system in our country, both for housing assistance through public housing agencies and private owners, um, and through the homeless assistance system. It's, they are very skilled people who do this work. Um, and the challenge that they face is simply not having the resources from the federal government to do more. So I, I am sure with this level of fast um, ESG dollars getting out that there might be some bumps in some communities, but in most communities, they are eager and ready to get those resources and put them to good work. And in the case of mo the way Congress has, al it, it will be allocating most of these dollars, these pots of money is about half of each pot will immediately or within 30 days, that's immediate for the federal government, will immediately go out under existing formulas. So there's not a lot of work that needs to get done there. It just goes through the system to the providers who are ready to receive it and put it to work. And then the rest of it will, will require and allow for um, a, even a little bit more um, targeting of those resources to communities that are maybe have the highest level of unsheltered populations or the greatest risk of transmission of COVID-19 or a combination of both. So the delivery system is there and is ready and the challenge is getting Congress to write the check. So now that they will, I, I'm confident that um, in most communities these dollars will be put to work very quickly. 
That's wonderful and encouraging to hear. Um, so on that note, uh, why don't we turn it over to some uh, Q&A. Um, and I'm just looking through the questions. Um, and actually, let's start with this one that I think is a really interesting and kind of nuanced question. Um, the uh, question is, how is the current COVID-19 situation um, helping us rethink our approach or the way that we look at vulnerable populations and how is it making dire circumstances more relatable? Uh, so the, you know, often uh, the, this person is writing, often our incredible vulnerable neighbors uh, are stigmatized and judged. Uh, how is this situation serving as sort of an equalizer and uh, you know, making the, their circumstances more relatable? I don't know. I think time will tell, right? I think it's too soon to say. I think in some cases we're seeing the stigmatism actually increase. Um, uh, you know, I talked earlier about some of the hotels that are contracting with city or states to house, temporarily house people who are homeless. We've had, we've seen, I know of cases of hotel owners who once they learned that it was a homeless person who was going to be living uh, or staying in that hotel room, they canceled the contract. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been in some communities, I think really increased um, uh, rhetoric that's harmful to people who are homeless because of a fear of spreading the illness. On the other hand, I think for sure uh, everybody, or I hope that everybody is recognizing in a very personal way how interconnected we are and how much my health in my community, my family's health depends on the health of everybody in our community. And that if we're not housing everybody, we're not going to be able to contain this disease. Um, I think that people are starting to recognize that and wake up to that. Certainly we've been talking for a long time that housing is healthcare. Um, and I think this moment really brings that home and forces us to feel that in a very personal way. Um, I hope that that then translates to a willingness to do more in the future. You know, the other thing I think that is, very, is really laid bare by this crisis are the massive holes in our social safety net and how deliberate public policies led us to this shredded social safety net. And again, where that leaves us now, I think more and more people are feeling the worry about their paycheck and their ability to keep a roof over their heads. And that too, I hope, translates into a willingness to do more once we come out of this crisis to fix the social safety net, to end homelessness, because we can, we choose not to, we have chosen not to up until now. Um, so that if we face a pandemic in our country again, we're not in this situation again. And for all the other reasons, we should have been doing this, you know, for months and for years. But it is, a, it, for sure, it's a, it's a, it's a teachable moment. It's a, it's a moment where all of us, I think, feel things that we've talked about or maybe never understood much more personally and directly. But I think it's much too soon to say what that means um, and how that translates to future change. I'm a very optimistic person generally, and I have to say in that case, I don't feel very optimistic at the moment that we will learn the lessons we need to, um, but I'm determined to try to get us to. <laughs> so speaking of uh, you know, stigmatized populations, uh, another question is asking about uh, prisoners who are being released due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, how are those prisoners' housing needs being addressed? They're not. It's a great question. And that's another one. That's, that's something, that's a need that um, existed before COVID-19 and is just that much more acute now. Uh, it's something that we have been working on for a long time when we talk about repairing or reforming our criminal justice system to ensure that when people who are currently incarcerated are able to go back to their communities, that there are homes that are affordable to them. We know through a lot of research that 
um, recidivism rates skyrocket when people don't have a safe home to return to for obvious reasons, right? Uh, and that becomes just that much more challenging now as we're looking at some communities recognizing the tremendous risk for people in jails and prisons from COVID-19 uh, and are starting to think about letting people out of jails and prisons, which we should, it just makes that much more um, urgent that we're providing resources to communities to maintain and create new housing that can accommodate all the people that need it to stay housed. And that goes too to you know the next um, the next spending package because there will be at least one more. And Congress is already coming up with their list, and the staff uh, are already starting to write it up. Producing affordable housing uh, is will be very needed for this reason, right? We're, we're, if we're talking about really releasing people from jails and prisons at a significant rate, again, as we should, we need to be building uh, affordable homes for them to stay in. And that the construction of these affordable homes also has the benefit of stimulating the economy. So it's, it's a win-win and we'll certainly push for that. Similarly, you know, funding to repair public housing has a similar effect uh, in both ways and something that we'll be pushing for through a stimulus package. Absolutely. Um, this question is from uh, Joan Service at the uh, Arizona Housing Coalition. Uh, first, she thanks you for your advocacy, Diane. Hi, Joan. And, <laughs> and uh, her question is, uh, while, uh, er, while we wait for Congress to pass a stimulus package, um, and thanks to the work of uh, the National Low Income Housing Coalition, in part, there's adequate support, uh, Joan is saying, for uh, folks facing housing insecurity and homelessness in Arizona. Um, in Arizona, she's mentioning the legislature uh, just passed an aid package as well that supports federal funds, but can't supplant the federal investment. So right. her question is, what are your suggestions on how to braid these resources together? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it becomes a little bit easier now that we know what resources are coming from the federal government. So local communities can start planning and should start planning right away to, to know that, for example, within 30 days, communities um, that get under the existing formula money through the emergency solutions grants, another $2 billion will be going out within 30 days for those same purposes. And similar with CDBG, um, very quickly about $2 billion will be going out to communities who already receive it through the same formula. So now you have something of an idea of new resources, new federal resources that will be coming to your community within a month. And I think you, can, you, you should start to plan and strategize for how if at the state and local level there are resources on the table, how these federal resources will be used in tandem so that we're meeting all of the needs that exist. Diane, a question, another question related to local efforts. Um, have you seen any examples of grassroots organizing to demand that local or state officials uh, pass more or take more proactive measures to increase housing security during COVID-19? Yeah, especially around eviction um, moratoriums. I think there's been some tremendous organizing. Some of the eviction moratoriums at state and local level um, came pretty quickly and came I think directly from the leadership of policymakers who saw the challenges ahead and just went ahead and implemented them. Others are absolutely a result of a lot of pressure that policymakers are feeling from renters in their communities that are demanding action from them. So there's definitely been a lot of uh, important and effective um, organizing and advocacy that's that that's pushing the policymakers to implement some of these some of these solutions. This question is related to Wall Street and uh, this idea that um, you know Wall Street and many shareholders pose uh, challenges with regard to social policies uh, that are perceived to have a negative impact on the market. Uh, do you have any thoughts on any efforts that are underway to re-educate Wall Street or shareholders? I'm not sure I get the question. To re-educate Wall Street and shareholders about my guess is about sort of why it's important to uh, uh, support 
social policies uh, that are traditionally perceived to have a negative impact on the market? Well, I think in the way that we always have, I think there are, there, there are partnerships to be had in some cases um, with Wall Street or you know, with big banks or with landlords. There are places where we can find agreement and we do. And in those cases, we push forward, um, at, you know, create these partnerships and create new solutions. In other cases, I think, like I was saying earlier, I think maybe this kind of moment in time teaches us the damage done to markets when there are such tremendous challenges for low-income people who suddenly can't pay their bills in any ways. I think certainly the housing industry is recognizing and, and feeling very concerned about the number of um, uh, mortgages that won't be paid and what that means for their bottom line. And so maybe that inspires people to, um, to join us towards solutions. But, and in many cases, there won't, we won't agree uh, because we have different outlooks and we have different um, goals in mind. And that's where organizing and advocacy and pressure through the media and through direct actions even um, get us to the results that we need question um, is uh, about the sort of what people can do uh, to protect themselves. So the question is, uh, we're seeing in the news that uh, evictions are continuing despite uh, the talk about moratoriums. Uh, so what can everyday renters and also homeowners uh, be doing to best protect themselves from losing their homes? Are there uh, rights or resources that they should know that they have, for example? Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a great question. And uh, it's hard to do nowadays, right? Because not only things are changing so quickly, but just the news in general is so overwhelming and there's so much to try to absorb. It's hard to sift through it all and know what impacts you directly and what you need to do related to that. So that's one of the things we've been working to do uh, at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. So we have what's called a Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition. This is a group that we um, convened after Hurricane Harvey about two and a half years ago, and it's grown since that time. It's now been about 850 organizations nationally, and together we work towards equitable and complete recoveries for the lowest income people from disasters. So we've mobilized, we've been working now for about two and a half weeks related to coronavirus, and we'll be working for the duration um, in all ways to, to assure this equitable and just recovery for the lowest income people from this disaster of coronavirus. One of the ways that we do that is um, on our website, which is nlihc.org, that stands for National Income Housing Coalition. We have a page on um, coronavirus resources. And what we put there is the information that's relevant to housing and homelessness. So we keep an ongoing list of all of the moratoriums that we know of at the state and the local level for evictions and foreclosures, all of the resources that we know that are available, all of the guidance that's coming out from HUD and from FEMA and from CDC that's relevant to housing and homelessness. And we're doing that with the hope that it helps sort of turn down the noise of this tremendous news moment and provides easily the information that's most relevant to low-income renters or to the people who serve them. So for an, a renter who's wondering if they're covered by any of these moratoriums, which is a really fair question and kind of hard to answer because it's such a patchwork of solutions, I'd really urge you to go to our website and see if in your community there is a moratorium eviction, a, 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 a moratorium on evictions or on foreclosures or other resources that might be available to you. We've also been doing weekly calls. Um, Monday will be our third national calls that everybody is invited to join. You can find the information how to do that on our website as well. Um, and that's where we hear from people in communities across the country and share information about what's happening at the federal level, both to, um, to share resources for individuals and local organizations that are most relevant right now, but also to inform our advocacy at the federal level. 
I'd really love to kind of just underscore the usefulness of uh, the National Low Income Housing Coalition website and some of the resources that they've been, uh, that you guys have been putting out. I know that in preparing for this conversation, I uh, perused the website and uh, found the resources to be really straightforward and helpful. Uh, so I would really encourage uh, everyone uh, tuning in to uh, check out the website and also the national calls, which are recorded. Um, so uh, I want to uh, take this opportunity to actually ask a, uh, you know, moderator's prerogative, ask my own question, uh, which is about how to get some of these great resources out to vulnerable communities who may not have internet access, for example, or who might be stuck inside their homes. Um, what is the best way, and this is a question that we uh, received earlier from a local group, you know, trying to make sure that it, as you said, get, uh, gets this patchwork of information out to uh, vulnerable um, renters. Uh, what are the best strategies for those who aren't online? Well, I think there's a lot, uh, yeah, especially not being online now is a particular challenge because so many people are required to stay home, including um, outreach workers and others who are usually in, in, in daily, at least touch with, with um, some really low income people. I'd say look in, in, in most communities, um, there are some really strong uh, organizing groups that are led by impacted people that are led by people who are homeless or um, that are low income renters themselves. A lot of really powerful groups out there that are already doing this work um, that could use your support, I'd say. Um, so to think about connecting with the groups that already exist and in whatever ways you can, finding ways to amplify their work and support their work and increase their capacity to do the work. Same with, um, with shelter providers, I'd say, you know, find the ones that are doing the work in your community and find, the, find out from them what they most need to be able to keep doing what they're doing and do more and then provide that. Great. Uh, so I'm just going to ask one last question. Uh, the question is, uh, there has historically been a shortage of rental units in the housing stock, uh, even prior to the pandemic. Um, yeah. And I'll add that, you know, uh, in particular, that's true of affordable rental units. Uh, and now there are stories highlighting situations where a single individual, for example, is leasing multiple units and then subletting them on Airbnb. Uh, can you speak to the impact of this phenomenon on some of the housing fallout of um, COVID-19? Um, and I'll just add a little bit to that and say, you know, are uh, the kind of the Airbnb renter or landlord community, are there any ways that they could uh, be helpful in this situation? Uh, well, sure, they could be helpful. I mean, if there are units that are um, vacant that could be used, for example, to house somebody who is homeless or about to lose their home, that would be tremendously helpful. That's needed in many communities. Um, I think that I think there's good actors and bad actors in many in many segments of the economy, including in the housing economy, um, and there are places where we have to make sure whether it's at the local state or national level that nobody is um, trying to or actually benefiting or profiting from the challenges that low-income renters are facing right now uh, and people who are homeless right now and that includes ensuring that there are there's no rent gouging going on you know after many um, after many disasters, there are often local anti-price gouging uh, policies put into place, you know, exorbitantly raising the rent because there's a disaster happening right now and there's more demand for your unit is price gouging and it should be prohibited. Um, also, we, we should be ensuring that there are not some unscrupulous landlords, which are not all landlords, but there certainly are some that are taking advantage of the chaos and the urgency to evict people so that they can raise rents in their units. Uh, you know, these are these are things that are happening, and we have to do more to ensure that it doesn't. Um, but also, 
you you said something about um, the the construction, I think, or it made me think about construction of affordable housing, which is also things are going to get really tough. Things are going to get worse before they get better, and the fallout might last for some time. And that's because in communities like, say, California, where there's already such a severe shortage of apartments, period, whether they're affordable to low-income people or not, there's just not enough homes for people to live in. And in some communities, um, the construction of housing that's in the pipeline or underway is starting to be halted. And I'm pretty sure soon, if things continue on the trajectory we're in, all of it will be. This means more shortages uh, down the line and more challenges for the lowest income renters. So the ripple effects of this disaster and of both the way we're needing to respond to it now and the financial fallout from it will last for a long time. And I think will really require of us um, even more dedicated advocacy, broader coalitions calling for the solutions um, and, and, and more direct work um, supporting local organizing organizers who are you know, building the power that we need to get to the change that we want. Well, thank you so much, Diane. With that, um, I'd like to uh, finish today's webinar. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, we will uh, be hosting another webinar uh, in the next uh, week and a half or so with some local perspectives from housing leaders in uh, Indianapolis, Winston-Salem, and Phoenix. So uh, please look out for an announcement about that sort of part two webinar. Um, in the meantime, I uh, really would love to thank you, Diane, for taking the time. I know that you have been incredibly busy advocating for uh, these solutions uh, in con with Congress and uh, all over the country. Uh, so uh, we're really fortunate to have you. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much. I uh, hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Stay uh, safe and healthy.